Well, thank you very much, Linda. It's it's really great that TCGA has a scientific symposium, and it's wonderful that so many people have signed up, as I understand it, from outside the narrow TCGA community to really open up the, the doors of this project in a very physical way, just as putting the data freely available on the web has been opening it up in a, an electronic way. So what the organizers asked me to do was give a kind of broad overview to kick off a, a first symposium about fulfilling the promise of cancer genomics. And I've chosen to organize it around a past, present, and future theme, particularly focusing on what lies ahead, which means what's not accomplished, what we don't know how to do and have to know how to do, what we haven't organized yet to do. Um, so for those of you who are you know, new to the TCGA project, I think this is the sign of a good project is that uh, whatever we've accomplished, that's all fun, but really the question is what, what really lies ahead is our work. And so that'll be the theme. So let me just kick off here, the past. Well, TCGA goes back a long way. It goes back to 1914, uh, not actually as a working project, but to Bovary's proposal that chromosome defects cause cancer. Now, this was proposed quite a long time ago, almost a century ago. And yet, uh, that sort of lost ground considerably over the course of the 20th century with the idea that viruses cause cancer, and that uh, by 1970, you could find a statement in a scientific paper with, with this great certainty the viral origin of the majority of malignant tumors is now documented beyond any reasonable doubt. One should always be suspicious about statements like that um, because that pretty much was the opening bell for finding out that the vast majority of tumors are not caused by viral changes. Um, really with the, the seminal work of Bishop and Varmus, with the discovery of the fact that viral oncogenes are related to cellular genes, um, and that many of the defects, most of the defects in cancer are indeed due to defects in cellular genes, with Bob Weinberg's discovery of a first proto-oncogene mutated in the human. By 1986, all of the major mechanisms of screwing up a gene were known. Point mutations in RAS, translocations in ABLE, amplifications of MYC, deletions of RB. They were all known that you could, in principle, do those things, but it was also clear that it was going to be unbelievably painful to find these things one at a time through transformation assays or through walking along the chromosome to map genes in different ways. And so Renato Del Becco proposed a pretty important thing. It was around the time people were beginning to talk about a human genome project, the idea of having the complete sequence of the human. And uh, a number of arguments were given, but Renato made a uh, strong argument in the pages of Science Magazine saying that sequencing the human genome was especially important because it would provide a turning point in cancer research. He said, we have two options. Either we're going to do it uh, piecemeal or we're going to do it wholesale. We're going to have the whole genome available to us. So these arguments in the late 1980s eventually prevailed and the Human Genome Project got started, as everybody knows, and by 2001 there was a draft sequence, in 2003 a finished sequence, and so by about the year 2000 people could begin to take genomic approaches, systematic approaches. The early couple years of the genome era saw the uses of microarrays for measuring DNA copy numbers and RNA expression. It saw early efforts using the sequencing technology that was available at the time of DNA sequencing. It saw the discoveries of RNAi and the recognition of the, the hints that one might be able to apply it systematically or still early for doing such things. And people began, notably the Sanger Center with its leadership, Johns Hopkins, folks in Boston at the Farber and the Broad, um, began doing systematic projects, discovering mutations uh, in classes of kinases primarily at the beginning, BRAF, PIK3CA, EGFR, um, all of which have important therapeutic implications, and studies integrating genomic information of different sorts, pointing by uh, a variety of methods to new kinds of genes. Well, again, the thing to do is be unsatisfied and impatient with how things are going. 
And by 2004, it was clear that the idea that a human genome sequence would be a good thing for cancer was, was true, but we needed to think more systematically. We needed to think in a more organized fashion. And the National Cancer Institute's National Cancer Advisory Board put together a working group with the harmless name Working Group on Biomedical Technology, whose uh, official mission was to um, figure out ways in which biomedical technology could be used to accelerate uh, progress in cancer research. And it very quickly focused on two things, one of which was the idea of what was then called a human cancer genome project. And this committee was put together of a number of people, and it got involvement of another 50 or 60 people in it. And it produced a report in February of 2005. And the report made the following arguments. It said, look, cancer is a genetic disease. Cancer is a highly heterogeneous disease. Cancer is an understandable disease. Systematic understanding would have major implications for the identification of cellular pathways that underlie cancer, selection of therapeutic targets, resolving cancer into homogeneous groups, faster and more finish, efficient clinical trials, improved applications of drugs, epidemiological study design, identifications of markers for early detection. It said we're still ignorant, and it said that a systematic understanding of the cancer genome would be technologically feasible within the next decade and that it, it, its cost would be reasonable. It would take about a 3% increase in the budget to the NCI to cover such a project. These, by the way, the slides I'm using for this little segment are actually the slides I used in the spring of 2005 reporting this report out or so. So I didn't, I didn't change any of these here. And uh, I think those still remain a good set of reasons. Now, the argument that was made there was that the Human Genome Project was a good analogy. When the Human Genome Project was proposed, it was in prehistoric days when ancient cavemen were running around without PCR technology and other things. And the thought of, and, and actually before automated sequencers were available, the thought of doing a Human Genome Project was absurd, but 1986 it was clear to folks that there were going to be ways to do it and that those ways would appear before us only if we started down the path. That there is a virtuous cycle. You start a project, it creates demand, people produce technologies, and onward and onward. And indeed, the real cost of the Human Genome Project, although nobody wrote it down in 1985, would have been $20 billion in 1985 technology. They said a dollar a base, but in fact, they were completely nuts. When you go back in cost, it was five or six dollars a base. And by the time of 2005, the cost of doing another human genome had plummeted to $20 million from $20 billion. Very good. Um, and the point about the plan was to be flexible and incremental and let it evolve and learn. So the same sort of lessons were proposed for what should be done with the Human Cancer Genome Project. That we should start with what you could do. You could do genomic loss and amplification with SNP chips and other copy number arrays. Get going on stuff like that. You could do point mutations in coding regions of some genes. And we set the goal of point mutations in all coding regions. Nobody breathed the word about sequencing the entire genome because that would have been considered so nuts as to put people off. So the report was very clear about it. We'd sequence all the coding regions, although there was a clear understanding that one would go further, but there was only so much you could say at the time. And that there were no really good ways to do chromosomal rearrangements and epigenetic changes at the time, but people could imagine them. People could actually propose them. There were ideas for how to do it. None had been implemented in 2004, 2005 yet, but it was clear it could happen. So the goal was set out for identifying all genomic alterations significantly associated with all major types of cancer by creating a large collection of samples and completely characterizing with respect to chromosomal loss and amplification, rearrangements, mutations, aberrant methylation, and gene expression, pretty much the plan there is today. As usually happens in these cases, many people hate it. Um, it's a natural human tendency. The objections were um, A, all cancer genes are already known. B, there are so many cancer genes that it's hopeless to ever find them all. One wished you could get those two arguments together in a room so they could annihilate each other rather than to have to answer each separately, but oh well. Um, 
And then, this is so expensive, it will destroy all scientific research and suck all the money out of the NIH. That's a usual argument that gets made in these cases. The argument was made, perhaps, um, most colorfully in this, this uh, Nature Biotechnology article called The Human Cancer Genome Project. One more misstep in the war on cancer that goes on to explain that this is a proposal to spend $12.5 billion uh, on this because they multiplied 12,500 cancers by what they thought the cost of sequencing a genome was then rather than what the report said, which is we thought it would fall by more than 100 fold. Um, but anyway, these arguments are always fun at the time. People get their bloods boiling and eventually it turns out that you start down the road and things get sorted out and there you go. So what present did this lead us to? It led us to a present where, by 2006, a pilot project had got kicked, gotten kicked off under the name the Cancer Genome Atlas. That was the name that was eventually decided, and this logo was eventually drawn, and the project got off the ground in a very slow, rumbling kind of way, recognizing that we didn't really have the samples we thought we had, and we didn't really quite know how to do the things, and that's just fine for a project. The early stages of a pilot project are to figure out all of the warts uh, involved in this stuff and admit them. And so it got, and then interest began to grow around the world. Obviously, the Sanger Center played a major role in cancer genome sequencing from the beginning, but that was a project at the Sanger. Now, other countries, whole countries began to get involved and say, we want to get, get involved in this cancer genome work. And an international cancer genome consortium that now has, you know, more than a dozen, uh, dozen and a half countries involved in, in, in this work. As for the cost of sequencing and this $12 billion figure that was proposed uh, in, in this critical editorial, well, the prediction of the committee in 2004 sort of was borne out. If you look at that graph where 2004 is, that's about a year or two before the line starts plummeting on a log scale. And that was because the folks on the committee had a pretty good idea that this line was going to go down. The only mistake that was made is it actually went down more than we thought it was going to go down. We said we'd get a factor of 100 within five years. We probably got a factor of more like 1,000 and change in those five years. Um, but no apologies there. So um, it got cheaper. That's good. So what's it gotten us to right now? Well, there are a lot of cancer genome papers from efforts. And here I'm thinking about whole genome efforts or whole exome efforts, but whole something efforts um, that are either published or that I know to be in print. And I do not pretend that this list is complete. So if your cancer is up there that's published or not in print, don't yell at me, just tell me and I'll put it on the slide. I did what I could in the past several days with the help of, of my colleagues to try to fill out a list here. And I did a very rough count of how many samples were involved. Now, many of these projects actually are smallish. They might have, you know, in some cases, a few samples or 10 samples that were looked at genome or exome wide, followed up with, with discoveries followed up in larger sample collections. Um, some of them involve a couple hundred samples. All told, I get about 600 samples are reported in these papers of either genomes or exomes. But we know that there's an awful lot more because we sent out some emails to the larger centers and got people's rough counts of how many whole genomes and how, how many whole exomes. And these are patients, so this is times two because there's a tumor and a normal. Um, and my best count from the rough uh, numbers that came back were more than 1,000 cancer genome pairs have been done and more than 9,000 cancer exome pairs have been done. There's an awful lot of data sitting around here and coming into papers and going to be coming out. So that's very exciting. What's been the implications of this scientifically? Well, insights from genomic approaches have emerged. The notion that we knew all cancer genes may have been overstated. We didn't really know all cancer genes. We didn't even know all classes of cancer genes. A lot more has been found out about protein and lipid kinases, BRAFs and PIK3CAs and PIK3R1, the regulatory partner of PIK3CA, EGFR, FGFR2, JAK2, but new things, lineage survival genes, transcription factors essential to the survival of certain lineages, the first being MITF and melanoma, NKX2-1 and lung, SOX9, SOX2 epigenomic regulators, a long list of, and growing list of epigenomic regulators pointing us to the critical role of epigenomics in cancer. Metabolic enzymes, the important discovery uh, of IDH1 from the Hopkins group, um, producing a neo-metabolite. Um, 
RNA splicing factors emerging in recent years, a whole list of RNA splicing factors. Important translocations. I remember when translocations were a feature of blood cancers but not solid tumors until that turned out to be false. And the demonstrations of, uh, by Rul Chanayan of, of Tempest to Erg uh, translocations, these ETS, ETS family translocations in prostate cancer, this incredibly important ALK translocations in lung cancer. Interesting surprises, even within the past year. Notch, known to be a oncogene in T cell ALL, is now a tumor suppressor gene. That is, loss of function of Notch also causes cancer, but different kinds of cancers, squamous cell cancers. This is actually pretty important because gamma secretase inhibitors, which inhibit the Notch pathway, are, were being tried in Alzheimer's disease. And they were noticing patients were getting squamous skin cancers. And uh, there was some mouse connection. This strongly suggests that you better watch out about inhibitors of the notch pathway. And it won't be enough, as has been suggested, to just look for skin cancers, because these are also clearly involved in head and neck cancer. So you're going to have to be monitoring patients on, an, on a, any notch pathway inhibitor for head and neck cancers as well. So all sorts of insights emerge. And of course, therapeutics are emerging. BRAF, a fantastic story of the past year. Um, EGFR, of course, with EGFR inhibitors, FGFR2, PIK3CA, ALK, um, and then things on the list there that we know pharmaceutical companies are very actively involved. Many pharmaceutical companies have IDH1 inhibitors in, in the works, et cetera. So a lot of work is being driven out of the pharmaceutical industry, and I can think of no pharmaceutical company out there that works in cancer that is not being driven right now by cancer genomics. This notwithstanding the fact that the New York Times likes to report that nothing much has come out of genomics, uh, as it did therapeutically, um, one would say the entire therapeutic industry and uh, the entire pharmaceutical industry with relation to cancer is now completely revolving around cancer genomics. But that's where we are. That's not enough. We got to do much more. So what I want to turn to a bit is the future. And if we have time, I want to even throw it open to a broad discussion about the future a bit. So what are the goals? What are the challenges ahead? I'm going to try to sketch out a vision for the next five to 10 years of what things have to be done. Many of them, I think, can be done pretty soon, within a couple of years. Some of them will take longer. Some of them we actually still have no idea how to do. But I'll sketch it out. And the goal is not to say this is the right vision. The goal is to say, we should all together be thinking about that vision. We now finally have the TCGA humming. That's just the time to start throwing monkey wrenches in and saying, OK, but what else should we be thinking about? So let me start by breaking it up into two pieces. One, the goal of a comprehensive catalog of the cancer genome, structural information, and the goal of a cancer therapeutic roadmap is what I'll call it, functional information. I'll talk mostly about number one, but then I'll turn to number two. Under a, can a comprehensive catalog of the cancer genome, we need to know all driver genes in all types of cancers, and we, know we need to know how they correlate with clinical phenotype. By driver gene, I mean any gene in which mutations can occur that propels the development of cancer. Well, how are we doing? And what are the challenges? Here are the items that I want to touch on under the cancer genome catalog. Our ability to interpret events. We're doing pretty good at finding events, but can we interpret events? Genes with significant mutation rates, focal amplifications and deletions, arm level events, methylation events, translocations, integrating different kinds of events, non-genic targets, germline events. How are we doing? Let me dwell on this first one. Finding significantly mutated genes. It is now possible to find mutations. There's no doubt. The sequencing's good. The mutation callers have become good. We can find mutations. Finding mutations is not the same thing as finding significantly mutated genes. As we look at the projects that come out, there's this tail of genes that are important. We know there are important genes in this tail here. Um, but have we got it right? Do we have the right genes being found? Are we finding too few genes that, or, or too many genes? Um, this incredibly important paper from the Johns Hopkins group on breast cancer, where they looked at 11 breast cancers and then did a follow-up on 24 breast cancers, contained 
well, I think scientifically very important work, but statistically an erroneous conclusion, which was a calculation, an inference of how many significant genes there were. It estimated that based on these 11 samples, there really must be about 122 significant genes in breast cancer, and that had to do with delicate issues of statistics. And it's a minor point, but it was an important early indicator that getting this right is very important. How are we doing? I think we're not doing as well as we think. And there's going to be a talk by Michael Lawrence this afternoon at 3 o'clock that will go into this in much more detail. And I'm going to channel a bit of Mike Lawrence's point, if I may, here. We are not so good at, at getting significance just right, but I think Mike has made a lot of progress on it. The lists currently, as produced, have too many significant genes. And yet, they're also not complete because we haven't gone far enough. Our tails are contaminated by stuff. How do we know? Mike Lawrence and Gaddy took 457 lung cancer samples, squamous plus adenocarcinoma, and put them through the official standard analytical pipeline now called Firehose, assuming a uniform mutation rate of 10 mutations per megabase. And now, because the sample is so large, they had the power to detect 843 significant genes. That should bother you. I don't think there should be 843 significant genes, but that's the official TCG analysis as of today. It also includes in those 843 genes 146 olfactory receptors. I am personally dubious. I do not mean to be prejudiced against smell, but I am dubious that 146 olfactory receptors contribute to cancer. The cub and sushi protein, which this TCGA reported is involved in ovarian cancer, comes up again in lung cancer and, frankly, in almost every cancer. Seems fishy. Ryanidine receptors, um, very important to cardiac calcium channels, seem fishy. Titan, largest protein in the human genome, 100,000 nucleotides there, comes up all the time. The statistical folks know there's a problem here. So you've got to go back to first principles. Defining significantly mutated genes. You find the mutations, you pile them up, you see how many there are, and you assign them a significance score. You do a significance score by comparing what you see to what you expect based on the background model. Pretty easy. What's the background model? Well, the simplest background model would be a constant mutation rate across the whole genome, every site, every gene, and across every patient. It's easy to write down the math. Very simple program. And uh, there you go. And you can look at the distribution of how many things you'll expect per gene or per sets of genes across patients. You'll get some nice Poisson distribution. You'll set your threshold in order to have a genome-wide significance level. And a little green line tells you anything above that is significant. But what if, in fact, it's heterogeneous? What if uh, some genes are mutated at a higher rate and some are mutated at a lower rate? The tail is fatter. That's all you really have to know. If you have the mixture of two distributions, the tail is fatter than you expect. If three quarters of the genes are at two per megabase and a quarter are at six per megabase, and you'd put the green line in the same place, the tail's too fat. You'll declare way too many significant genes. So is there non-uniformity? Is there heterogeneity? Yes. The data are now in from the TCGA. When we look, and oh, and by the way, a symptom of this, when you have the wrong model, the problem gets worse and worse and worse the more data you have. Eventually, lots of things become significant. So cancer types show very distinctive mutation rates across 3,000 samples now uh, that, that we have in our database, largely these samples done at Broad, as, as well as some other sa published samples here. We've got um, very different mutation rates. They vary 20-fold in their means across cancer types. And individual tumors from one type to another here can differ by 1,000-fold in their mutation rate. That's a big deal. The melanomas and lung cancers, a lot of things associated with lots of mutagens are over there on the right and, and such. Not only do they have different rates, they have different patterns. Those pretty colors down at the bottom indicate the frequency of the mutational spectrum of different cancers, and they're different. If you make a radial plot where you plot the distance from the center is the mutation rate and the angle reflects uh, some aspect of the mutational distribution, you get this really pretty picture where the lungs are over there and the, the melanomas are down there and the GBMs are up there in terms of having very different spectra. I actually think it's really interesting that the lung has these two stripes there. 
lung might have two meaningful subtypes there that have somewhat different mutational processes, and we ought to understand what they are. Melanoma has two stripes. Very interestingly, head and neck cancer that has HPV involvement and cervical cancer that has HPV involvement is clustered up there with bladder cancer suggesting perhaps that too has a viral involvement in many or most of its cases. You can read fun things off these pictures, but for the moment what I want to read is heterogeneity. So uh, there's another thing. Not only are the sites different, the genes themselves have inherently different mutation rates. One reason is genes that are more highly expressed have lower mutation rates due to transcription coupled repair. And this simple bar chart tells you that. And it's a non-trivial difference here. That's like a 1.3, 1.4 fold difference, which matters between the most expressed and the least expressed. But that alone is not enough. If you take that out of the picture, you still see, based on whole genome samples in cancer, tremendous regional differences in mutation rates. What's going on? We now have enough data to see that they differ. Well, here, Shamil Sunayev suggested that we should look to the people who are doing germline human genetics, the Thousand Genomes Project. They, too, have been noticing funny differences in mutation rates across the genome. And with regard to the germline and germline cells, not somatic mutations, they found that there was a significant correlation with replication timing. Late replicating regions in the germline have higher mutation rates than early replicating mutations. You can tell yourself the story that maybe the pools of nucleotides are used up or pools of some factors are used up. Well, is that true for cancer, somatic mutation as well? And the answer is, let's draw in the replication time in black. Yes, looks pretty good. And below, we've got going from blue to red, early to late replication, and the mutation rate is rising. Does it matter? Yes. Here's a region very high mutation rate. The black line goes up. Now, by the way, these replication time measurements saturate at a certain point. That little black thing over CSMD3 should be going up, probably. You can project that it's going up, and this is just a saturated assay for replication time. What is that CSMD3? That's the cub and sushi domain protein that we've been finding in all these cancers there. Um, uh, it's, it's in a region of very late replication, and its mutation rate is not surprising given that, especially when you recognize that it's truncated at the top. What about those olfactory receptors? There's a region of 16 olfactory receptors there on chromosome 1, high mutation rate locally in the surrounding DNA, non-genic DNA, and late replication time. Moreover, if you just make a histogram of early versus late replication time, olfactory receptors as a whole are fashionably late in the genome. And so there you go. So now you could start correcting for heterogeneity across sites, heterogeneity across um, genes and regions, and heterogeneity across patient samples. And when you do that, what Mike Lawrence and Gaddy find, are that the before, depending on where you set your FDR level, you had 588 genes, and now there's 61. You had 108 olfactory receptors, now there's three. If you use a harder-nosed uh, cutoff there, you started with 261, you get down to 18 no olfactory receptors. You do this across a bunch of cancers, the olfactory receptors are your canaries in the mine. They go away. You feel good when your olfactory receptors go away there on your lists. Um, and I think there's obviously more work to do because I, I have reasons to think it's not perfect yet, but this is a really important thing. In the end, we need to know the background rate. We need to use our data to bootstrap up the background rate across the genome in order to call the significance correctly. Mike will talk about this more, and, and you can talk to Gaddy about this. This is just one example of the care that has to go into getting this stuff right. Now, focal amplifications and deletions. In each of these cancers, using either sequencing or arrays or something like that, you can look at the focal amplifications, the focal deletions across the genome, and you often find something like 10% of the genome in a typical cancer is engaged in either focal amplifications or focal deletions. Um, in the ovarian cancer paper for TCGA, the high-grade serous uh, ovarian, there were 63 significant deletions, 50 significant amplifications. Um, for the global cancer map with 3,000 samples, a, a paper that was uh, published a little while ago, uh, 26 different types, you see things like this. How are we really doing? 
Well, the amplifications, I think, are mostly right. The challenge with the amplifications are finding the driver gene in the amplification. That's a question of numbers. The more and more samples you get, the more you should be able to home in on, and that's beginning to happen. But we need large numbers to know which gene in the amplification. Now, there may be functional ways to complement it as well with RNAi if you have the right cell lines, and we'll come back to that a bit. The deletions still have some real issues attached to them. Because we're, how are we counting whether the deletion is significant? Well, it depends on what the background deletion rate is in cancer cells. We have no way of measuring the background deletion rate. It's the foreground and the background. There is no null model for what deletion should be happening. And so it's not obvious. We can say this is significant relative to other regions of the genome, but if a region was deletion prone, but not cancer related, just deletion prone, we could make a mistake. And so, as been pointed out by Mike Stratton and folks at the Sanger, you should feel much better if you see homozygous deletion, because then you had two events, if you see a significant rate of, of that, or a deletion in trans to a mutation. We have to get a little better, I think, at figuring out what the right gene is and which of these deletions truly are significant. I think many of them will be, but there's work to be done. Arm level events. Almost the entire genome is either significantly gained or significantly lost in some cancer. There are a few chromosomes that don't do much, but for the most part, um, something like uh, for an average cancer, 25% of the genome is engaged in an arm level amplification, two copies or deletion of a copy or two. We can document all of that. It's easy. It's beautiful. It's also almost entirely cryptic. For the most part, we should be honest and say, we haven't a clue what the driver gene is. Why does the cell want to duplicate that? Is it even one? Is it could be that there are three things that it wants two copies of, and the best way to do it is duplicate the arm. We don't know, and we don't have good tools. There are some suggestions that, uh, you know, on chromosome 7, the, the amplification of 7 is not necessarily driven by EGFR, but maybe by MET. There's some other, but we don't have any systematic ways. We need to figure out the arm level events, because there are 25% of the chromosomes involved in these things. Methylation has been triumphant. As part of TCGA, there's just gorgeous ability to study methylation of promoters across the genome, and beautiful work such as this one here in glioma of identifying subgroups that um, have uh, methylation, distinct CPG island methylator phenotypes that define distinct subgroups of glioma. Beautiful, beautiful work. And yet, we have no way to find what the driver gene is in there. There's a lot of things that have been methylated, but we don't have an easy way to say who matters. The methylation is often going to be all genes with a given chromatin structure get methylated in a certain circumstance. A hundred things may get methylated. One of them or four of them are the critical targets. We have to start beginning to document what are all of the methylated targets that matter? Now, there are important ideas here. There's been interesting progress here. But systematic approaches to figuring out which methylated targets truly matter in a, in a meaningful way, we have far to go. Translocations. There are these important uh, translocations that have been found, of course, in blood cancers known for a long time, BCR able, of course, the ERG translocations, the ALK translocations. Lots of cool biology, amazing progress has been emerging from the TCGA. Glioblastoma, these, uh, there's an example of this beautiful chromothripsis, a chromosome going through the shredder all at once in some catastrophic event. <laughs> Um, with prostate cancer, a beautiful example of a daisy chain of eight successive events of A's attached to B, B's attached to C, C's attached to D, da, 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 and back up to the front, involving multiple cancer genes, um, as if, and surely it means, that these events occurred simultaneously. So there are catastrophes that are of different sorts that are happening. There's even been some very nice demonstrations that they affect the 3D, that they are related to the 3D structure of the genome. As people begin to build 3D maps of the genome, things that get broken and rearranged next to each other can be shown to be um, uh, physically in 3D space on average much closer to each other. And the distributions of lengths of, of somatic copy number alterations that you see in cancer match pretty well with the uh, contact distances that you see in these 3D maps. But we're nowhere near done with enumerating the translocations because we don't have that much whole genomic data and because translocation rates and patterns vary across cancer types. So we need to deal with the significance of these events, and we need a lot more data to reach completeness. They're very important. 
but we need more data. Putting together these events can be very powerful. In the TCG ovarian paper, it's noted that BRCA can be, BRCA1 or 2 can be inactivated either germline or somatically, but you don't see both. It's kind of nice. The, the mutual exclusivity is a very helpful clue. The fact that they cover more of the space or by epigenetic silencing. Now here you feel good that that epigenetics is directed at BRCA, but it's these other loci that is going to be methylated, you know what to say about. Beautiful work of Leslie Cope in lung. Um, has shown this picture here that Leslie's given me permission to show of, of uh, CDN, uh, CDKN2A, where you have samples that are methylated, mutated, or deleted, and you kind of have a mutually exclusive uh, distribution that covers essentially everything. You feel really good then. Does it look, how often do things look like that? So this integrating events, we need a lot of data to get this right. And this will help us see the significance of many events when we see multiple independent ways of hitting them in a systematic fashion. Non-genic targets. We still are focusing on the coding region. So though we're sequencing the whole genome, we can't really point to an awful lot of non-genic space that we can say has been importantly mutated in cancer. Oh, there are a couple places in whole genome papers where we say, you know, there's a statistically significant pileup of, of a few more mutations than you'd expect in some non-genic region, some non-coding region. But it's hard to know what to make of those things. Unless you, for example, in that little region under the question mark, know that was an important element, it's really tough to, to make a significant call around these sorts of things. And, uh, you know, we talk a lot about the whole genome, but we really have very little to say about the whole rest of the genome in cancer. We need to admit it and figure out ways to do it. Microbes. Well, the idea that viruses cause cancer is not entirely wrong, of course. Viruses do cause some cancers, just not most cancers. And the list is not done yet. This beautiful uh, paper from Fung et al. showing the presence of a poly new kind of polyoma virus in Merkel cell carcinoma is a beautiful example of that that's come through a uh, whole genome sequence, a uh, whole, whole transcriptome sequencing in this case. Um, uh, Matt Meyerson's group has demonstrated the presence of a particular class of bacteria, Fusarium, in colon cancer. Whether this is a cause or an effect remains to be demonstrated, and that's really a, a critical thing, is one can find correlation, but causation is more of a challenge here. Um, but once you know it, you can at least begin to look. Germline mutations. Well, we know germline mutations that cause cancer, BRCA1, P53, Lee Fraumeni syndrome. But you know, there's more heritability for cancer than is accounted for by the handful of genes we know. Um, you know, two sisters, one gets breast cancer, the chance the other gets breast cancer is considerably higher than we can account for. What's going on? Common variants of small effects, rare variants of large effects. Genome-wide association studies have been pointing to loci that are involved. Those are very interesting. Rare variant studies, well, we got to do them. So far, there's remarkably little data. We could be mining our TCGA data for rare variants, but we have to get serious about the numbers involved. Um, it takes goodly numbers. If you want to detect rare variants that are present collectively, the sum of the rare variants are present often at a frequency of about 1%. And if you want ones that, say, uh, increase a cancer risk by five-fold, you need about three, 4,000 tumors to do something like that. No, I'm sorry, I'm, re I'm misreading the graph here. 1,500 tumors to do something like that. That's not impossible to do, but we have to get to those numbers to be able to see it and be able to recognize. That would be to recognize a totally new gene we weren't expecting. Of course, if we just want to do it in the three or 400 already existing cancer genes, and we know that that gene is already mutated in that cancer type somatically, then it becomes statistically much more favorable to be looking. And we should be doing that kind of looking. So we ought to be mining TCGA more for the germline information about cancer, because that could be of important predictive value for patients, at least certainly for early screening. So we just need sample size to do that. So um, that's kind of our tick list. We're doing great. Tremendous amount of data has been generated. We can describe events. We can't fully interpret those events. We have to get better at it. And we have to begin to integrate across tumor types, not just integrate across samples, but begin to pile together, as I know is a theme of this meeting, all the tumor types and say, what emerges when we look across many tumors? Important. Well, a bottom line here is we have barely begun. There's a lot more that's got to be done to accomplish these goals. I anticipate that pretty soon people will start saying, oh, we've sequenced the cancer genome, we're done with that, we should move on. 
we have not yet begun in this in terms of what we really need to extract from it. And so I suggest one holds the line against these early declarations of, of uh, complete victory on things. How are we going to achieve completeness? Well, sample size. Fact one, the original report from the NCI called for 250 samples per tumor type based on a calculation of an expected background mutation rate. We now know that background mutation rate is wrong for many cancers. Redo the calculation. You need more samples. It's dependent on the mutation rate. It's probably going to be the case that for many of these tumor types, we need several thousand camp, uh, samples in order to get the desired sensitivity. It's not terrible. It doesn't scare us anymore to do that. Sequencing depth. There are some pretty unfavorable cases. Only 5% of the reads from pancreatic tumors come from the pancreatic uh, cancer cells as opposed from the surrounding cells. Oh well, one can probably brute force that. Scope. So far, TCGA has focused on the large, pri large tumors, primary tumors, surgically treatable tumors, pre-treatment tumors. Um, we focus on surgically treatable tumors because if the tumor is not surgically treatable, there's a problem with the ethics of biopsying that tumor, people say. Maybe there's a problem fundamentally with the reimbursement of biopsying that tumor. Whatever it is, we have to get past that and understand um, the, the wide range of tumors that are out there. We need to understand the intratumor diversity, diversity within a given tumor, uh, different cells within that tumor. We have to understand non-resectable cancers, metastases, and I know work is going on to do that, but we have to think systematically about it. We need to understand pre-cancer, polyps, for example, more and more feasible as the requirements for, for nucleic acids are dropping. And we ought to be accessing circulating tumor cells. These are all part of our future. And I don't think there's anything controversial here. We just have to do it. If we're going to correlate this with clinical information, though, we're going to have to take another step. We are going to need to create something which I'll call a global cancer alliance, a shared knowledge base where patients around the world can choose to contribute their genomic data and their clinical data so it can be used to improve the understanding and treatment of cancer. Ideally, we're going to be having drugs coming out over the next decade, many, many different types of drugs emerging, being used in different kinds of combinations. How are we going to capture that knowledge? We're going to need the cancer genome. We're going to need clinical records. And you can say as much as you want about the problems with this, the privacy challenges and the computing challenges. But go explain to our children why we didn't do this, because we couldn't figure out how to do this, and why people couldn't consent. The vast majority of cancer patients, when given a chance to make their experience even more meaningful by making a gift to future people who might face cancer, will just say yes. And we ought to start from that, that proposition, that if most people, would, every one of us in this room would say yes. We, and so if everybody would say yes, there's a problem with us wringing our hands about the fact that everybody will be worried about that. They're mostly going to be worried about the fact that they have cancer and somebody else in the future might have cancer. We need to think about how to do this. Now, that's the comprehensive catalog of cancer. I'll be much more brief on this question of a cancer therapeutic roadmap and then just throw it open. For a cancer therapeutic roadmap, we have to go to function. We need to be able to recognize the functional pathways and the mechanisms in which targets act. We need to know for every cancer as a function of its genome what its vulnerabilities are. We need to know as a function of its genome for any given treatment you're going to give it what ways it has to escape that treatment, the ways it's going to become resistant. That is what I mean by a cancer therapeutic roadmap. We know the pathways, we know the vulnerabilities, and we know the mechanisms of resistance in advance so we can design therapy to be maximally likely to succeed. By a cancer therapeutic roadmap, then, some genes, we know what they do. They should be put in pathways. But genes are emerging. For example, the multiple myeloma study, um, FAM46C. I didn't know what FAM46C was. It's called FAM46C because it's uh, in family 46, number C, letter C in that family. Its function wasn't known. But you can take the expression pattern of FAM46C and compare it to many other cells, in particular to many multiple myeloma samples, and darned if it isn't perfectly correlated with ribosomal proteins. I mean perfectly correlated with ribosomal proteins. It's involved in ribosomal proteins, protein trans in the translation of proteins, et cetera. We need the systematic knowledge to rapidly attach function. We also need to know where to intervene. The mutated gene may not be the best target especially if it's a loss of function. 
Inhibiting something that's lost its function is not really a smart idea. Um, even inhibiting something that has gained the function when we don't know how to inhibit it may not be the best place. We need to plan vulnerabilities. So I'll just mention projects that I know. These are my favorite projects, but there should be many of these things. Something that Todd Golub and Justin Lamb at the Broad have built, the connectivity map, which is kind of a Google for biological function. You want to connect up the effects of diseases and genes and drugs. The way to do it is put them in a common language. Let's say gene expression. For any given gene or drug, just get the expression pattern and put it in a big compendium. And then when you have a new gene, gene A, and you knock it out and you see what the expression consequences are of knocking it out, look it up and say, golly, knocking out gene A looks a lot like knocking out gene C and, drug, and applying drug F. That's good. And you, can, oops, sorry, and you can do that. If you treat a rat with estrogen, one of the early examples they've shown, and you look at gene expression in the uterus and you look it up, the same signature comes up of treating cells with estrogen. And if you apply minus one to that signature, the anti-signature comes up with tamoxifens and selective estrogen receptor modulators. So you can look it up. If you didn't know, you could find it. Um, many examples have been shown now where you can look stuff up. So what they wanted to do is expand it in GEO, the gene expression omnibus. There are about 300,000 expression profiles, but they're scattered all over the place, many, many different experiments. They're not, they're not comprehensive. They're expensive to generate. What they wanted to do was simply generate one big compendium of knocking out genes in, a, in many different cell types, studying the expression pattern. And because spending a couple hundred bucks on an AFI chip for every expression is kind of pricey, they worked out a way to do it for three bucks. That basically involves, you don't need to look at all 20,000 genes. 1,000 genes will serve as a proxy. You can impute the rest. You can do the 1,000 genes by using beads with appropriate tags in the right way. And anyway, they made it work. They so far have 300,000 profiles that they themselves have generated here uh, with 4,000 different compounds, 2,000 genes that have been knocked out or added back across 10 different cell lines. This has got to grow. And this is like Google. The more data that's in there, the more powerful it gets. It's a network effect. The more we populate it, the more conclusions get drawn. And the NIH has come to support these projects under the banner of LINCS, which I forget what it stands for. But anyway, it's LINCS, the library of something. Anyway, um, these kinds of things are good. You can use them to test function. In folks who are studying inherited disease, like Crohn's disease, they find GWAS hits in a gene ATG16L1. You look at the perturbation of that gene. It's related to the perturbation of another gene. There, this other guy's involved in autophagy. Therefore, this guy's involved in autophagy. And it turns out it is involved in autophagy. You get a whole bunch of hits in, in a study, like this Crohn's GWAS. You look at all of them and you say, all right, I know what they do. But these seven all produce very similar signatures when you perturb them. That's a good thing. And onward. These kinds of tools are the things we need. We need them not just for RNA. We need them for what are the epigenomic consequences of doing things? What are the proteomic consequences of doing things? What are the metabolomic consequences of doing things? It is Google for biological function. We also need Google for cancer function in particular. So there's a project that, that a number of my colleagues, Levi Garraway and others, uh, have going called the Cancer Cell Line Encyclopedia, uh, being supported as a, a public effort by, uh, between Broad and Novartis. And I'll give that as an example. And again, there are other projects like this, and they all should go forward. Um, basically, take a thousand cancer cell lines, study their complete genome, and study their properties in a wide variety of assays. Start looking stuff up. Thousand cancer genomes, from, sorry, a thousand cancer cell lines. Here you need to grow cell lines. A thousand cancer cell lines know their genomes, you know all the aberrations. Knock out every gene with RNAi in a pooled fashion. Which RNAi's make which cell lines drop dead? And then you can start doing Google. You can say, aha, cancers with amplification in gene A are selectively killed by inhibition of gene D. Cancers with mutations in gene B are selectively killed by drug E. And many such things are emerging out of this study. Bill Hahn had a beautiful paper on systematic inve investigation of genomic uh, vulnerabilities in uh, early report from something called a Project Achilles. Resistance catalogs. Take 1,000 cancer cell lines. Take treatments that you might want to do, BRAF inhibition, for example, and ask, how could I overcome BRAF inhibition? Well, I could go to the clinic and try it on a patient, but why not do it in a dish first? What genes, when you add them back or knock them out, will overcome BRAF inhibition? What stromal cells will overcome BRAF inhibition? Maybe they're giving an agent. And again, you can find those questions. These kinds of systematic functional databases 
will empower a community to go beyond the descriptive aspects of TCGA. And Levi Garraway is a beautiful example here, where specifically with regard to RAF inhibition, he was able to show that um, cut uh, amplification the, 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 uh, turns, uh, confers resistance to RAF inhibition, and indeed then after seeing this in cell lines, demonstrated it's also true in patients. That is a mechanism that's used in patients. So all right, the goals, comprehensive catalog of cancer genome, that's pretty much the same goal that was laid down some time ago. It's just we have to get serious about completing that goal across all the different types, truly understanding those events, and a cancer therapeutic roadmap, this functional roadmap. Now, all of this is the kind of large-scale comprehensive views. This is also going to take an entire community of cancer investigators around the world to, around the world to truly translate into therapy. So the goal of projects like this are to make sure that all the data, all the tools, all the computational tools are out there. But it's the goal of the whole world to use this information and to use it to drive cancer, so drive, drive cancer treatment. So the data has to be open and it has to be usable. Very important. It's not enough to say it does exist on the web, good luck. You really have to make it usable. And we have to engage an entire community in doing it. Anyway, I was asked to give some kind of an overview. That was some kind of an overview. I would like to acknowledge the fact that this is not a talk, obviously, from my group or from the Broad or anything like that. This is a talk of you know, what we as a TCGA community have been doing, what we as an ICGC community have been doing. And it's a remarkable thing what we have been doing to get to this point, to think that from those early days when we imagined what might be possible to see where we've gotten is just stunning. I do want to make special acknowledgments to a couple of my colleagues at the Broad who helped uh, in thinking about this talk. I'm, I'm channeling ideas and things from a number of people, Gaddy Getz and and Mike Lawrence, and Todd Golub, and Stacey Gabriel, and Levi Garraway, Matt Myers, and Bill Hahn, Justin Lamb, Linda Chin, who's been a member of the Broad community, and still is, even though she's in Texas right now, in our sequencing platform. I shall stop there. Thanks. I think, we have, I think we have time for some questions. And I, I'd like to start. Yeah. Wonderful overview talk. Thinking about the next step, um, the cancer therapeutic roadmap that you uh, challenge, put on the table. Do you see um, value, thinking about mirroring what we're doing in the cancer genomic area, do you see value in approaches to coordinate and centralize such an effort to uh, minimize redundancy and accelerate? Go, the progress in that, and, and if you were to do it, how, how would you do it, and, and what do we have to do to get that going? So I'm always suspicious of words like centralize. Um, the TCJ is strong because it's not exactly centralized. Wrong word, sorry. But no, no, but I want to distinguish it. Coordinate is good, and mostly what it is is take it on at the necessary scale. If every investigator in the world takes their favorite gene and knocks it out with RNAi and their favorite cell type, and we attempt to aggregate those data, they will be useless because there will be no quality control on them. We won't have all the stuff filled in. So there's always a right scale for doing any effort. It has to be a scale that's going to be able to get high quality data that people can count on. Like we have our sequence has to be good sequence collectively. Um, it's got to be able to be comprehensive enough so I don't want a centralized approach, but I do think we need significant scale efforts in places that are willing to do heavy lifting, and we need to coordinate those. And the, the things that ought to come out of them are what the community needs. Many of these ideas start off as pilot projects. You know, what, what might be useful? And they've got to prove themselves as useful. I've tossed out, it could be useful to have proteomic signatures. And you could say, oh, that's infinitely expensive. On the other hand, there are cheap methods now coming along to make antiphosphoproteome uh, antibodies that are pan-phosphoproteome that you can fly in a mass spec and maybe you can do that cheaply. So there's always a kind of goal, a game of is it pretty cheap to get that data? If it costs a buck to get the data, maybe, you know. So yes, we should have a discussion about creating a cancer therapeutic roadmap 
vaguely along the lines I've described. I do not mean to be didactic that what I put up there is what it should be, but it should not be the case that every investigator out there must discover all those facts him or herself. We collectively should be responsible for making sure that any of those facts are collected, done at high quality, are openly freely available. Hi, uh, you touched on this, but maybe you could expand further on the topic of integrating, let's get at systematically integrating non-coding effects into interpreting cancer genomes. Is there anything going on as part of the TCGA? Um, at the moment, I think it consists of smart people at different centers trying to figure out how we're going to take these non-coding regions. There's nothing, I, I can't say anything vaguely intelligent other than correct for the background mutation rate and look for an excess. And the problem is many of these non-coding regions are small, and so you're not going to get an excess in a small little region. We get excesses often across a large coding region. So maybe you have to aggregate some of them. Maybe you have to take all the regulatory regions for a gene, and that makes a big enough target that you can detect it. That would be good if we knew what all the regulatory regions for a gene were. So that's the challenge right, right. now. Right. And I'd be very happy to see three great examples. And that would teach us a lot. So I put it out as a challenge to the students. I don't actually have great examples. Well, I'm, you know, I'm a co-author on a paper that points to a region that does actually reach statistical significance. But that isn't the same thing as, as actually being deeply meaningful yet. Well, there is some effort as part of ENCODE, but it seems like this could be expanded quite a bit. Oh, ENCODE uh, is trying to find important regions right. across the genome, but integrating right. that with cancer exactly, mutation yeah. data and figuring out which ones should be. I, I don't mean to say that people aren't aware that there are such regions and they're being well characterized, but ENCODE and TCGA do not yet have a fruitful love child. <laughs> One more question. I would like to ask about the heterogeneity of disease and how we can approach that through targeted therapy. If you just take as a number, say 25, let's say a certain carcinoma may have 25 possible mutations, a com any combination of three of which would create a tumor. 25 choose three without replacement gives you 2,300 possible combinations of three. Yet, when we treat patients, we start with a single targeted therapy and wait for it to fail. When are we going to address this problem of combinatorics and multiple targeted therapies? So I'll offer my personal opinion, which is the only way, and I don't think this is so controversial, the only way we're going to effectively treat cancer is not serially, but in combination at the same time. The idea of waiting to use one agent, or using one agent and waiting till it fails and using the next agent and fails in the next agent is stupid. It comes back from old days of agents that just are incredibly toxic and you can't combine things. But in point of fact, the answer is clear from HIV. In HIV, we do a triple drug therapy. Every, each one of those drugs will fail. If you use them in serial, they fail. If you use them in parallel, you multiply the probability. There's a, P is the probability of escape from the first drug. P cubed is the probability of the escape from all three drugs. P cubed, you win because it's a very small number. P, you don't win. The answer for us in cancer is, what exponent do we have to raise P to to exceed the number of cells that are there? Now, I'm hoping it's not going to be a gazillion different drugs because it'll be a certain number of pathways, and you're going to figure out where to inhibit that pathway. The point about finding these multiple points of inhibition by these Project Achilles methods is that if we can make targeted agents with big therapeutic windows, safe agents without lots of side effects, the right cancer therapy had better be use them all together. Now, it raises a lot of questions. Drug companies don't like to develop three things at the same time. The FDA is still getting its mind wrapped around how to run approval for two or three things simultaneously. They'd rather approve each one separately. But, you know, we're seeing it. BRAF. BRAF, is, the BRAF inhibitors, miracle drug, except it fails within a year. Now people are thinking about what they're going to add to it. They're not going to run that serially. They're eventually going to run that in parallel. We, the whole point of my plea for systematic approaches is precisely to address your question. When we have a cancer therapeutic roadmap that says here are multiple places to interdict and here are the ways cancer will get around it by amplifying that, let's be prepared to be able to cut that off, that is when we will have really rational cancer therapy. 
We're lucky in some cases with Gleevec, and we're lucky in some cases with other things. The goal of TCGA and its successors of creating a cancer therapeutic roadmap is not to have to be lucky. Anyway, that's some thoughts. <laughs>